Okay. So why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself then. Your My name is Helen Thomas, and I'm a Hearst Newspapers columnist. Okay. And uh, when I'm looking at the time period uh, building up to the war in Iraq, how would you evaluate your, uh, your fellow, the, the whole press corps' performance uh, leading up to the war? Poor. So, okay, I'm not, I'm going to be, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be including my questions. Yeah, okay. So. I think that uh, White House Press Corps and the Pentagon Press did a very poor job in the run-up to the war. Didn't ask the right questions, didn't ask, in fact, hardly any questions that would challenge the premises for going to war. And why do you attribute that to? Why weren't these questions being asked? I attribute it to 9-11, which, uh, put everyone in a patriotic mode, being afraid of being called un-American, and uh, just afraid, really, that you would be rocking the boat. And when you look at the... Uh, I don't put myself in that category. I asked very, very tough questions, became almost persona non grata because of it. And but I think it's the job of the, a reporter to do that. So, in other words, the job of the reporter to ask the, the tough questions. Tough questions and, you know, not just tough, just penetrating the whys and, and prove it and so forth. Now we find out there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq that were usable, certainly were not discovered, no ties to al-Qaeda, terrorist organization, and no threat. And leading up to the, the war in Iraq, there was... Uh, a sense that those why questions were not being asked at all. No proof was asked on anything. They just blithely accepted everything. And uh, I think we really defaulted on our, our real role, which is because we are the only transmission belt from the White House. The White House Press Corps is the only institution in our society that can ask the president a question. That, and the Presidential News Conference is the only forum in our society where a president can be questioned and held accountable. And if they're not questioned, they could rule like dictators, by edict alone. And it, it seems like the, the communications policy has been to kind of, when the president does have a press conference, to not allow the tough questions to even be asked, the scripted nature of it. And can you speak to that a little bit? I don't think that there's any that kind of censorship, per se, because the president, they can pretty, the White House can pretty well predict what we're going to ask. We'll go for the headlines of the day if we're certainly in, interested in, in news. Uh, at the same time, I don't believe that the White House censors, per se, but the, certainly the president had a list of people he would call on. And um, um, I, I think that the censorship almost comes from a self-censorship rather than from on high. We can ask anything we want, and, and I'm sure they wouldn't. They just have to stand and take it. But we didn't ask what well, should have been asked, obviously, for proof. And what do you, is there a sense of a, a pack mentality, of a conformity? Can you talk a little bit about the psychological, you know, so well, I, th I think the whole atmospherics of patriotism, bring out the flag and so forth, after 9-11, it was a period of great trauma for the whole country, and certainly reporters are Americans and human beings also, and we certainly were infected with the same reticence to, to challenge. So in that sense, there is a pack mentality. I think that, uh, that we went into a coma. But I think we're coming out of it now, finally. But it's a little too late, and too many people are dead. Too many people. Okay, great. And um, it seems like the uh, the White House crafts a very uh, detailed, specific message of the day. You know, they even have a global <laughs> message that they send out. Can you talk about the talking points and how they stick to them? Every time the president or his press spokesman, or anybody, even the vice president, or any of their entourage, top, top side, ever said Saddam Hussein, they said 9-11. Saddam Hussein, 9-11, all in the same breath, constantly, daily. 
it is no wonder that the American people certainly would thought there was a strong tie there. I mean, they did the subliminal message, which anybody knows who's ever studied anything about uh, trying to get a message over. And when you're looking at the, the build-up... By repetition. And when you're looking at the build-up to the war in Iraq, did, did, was there a sense that any time that the, the press corps as a whole saw war as inevitable, that it didn't matter? I saw it from the day the president stepped into the White House. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, Saddam Hussein was on the radar screen. We hadn't heard from him from 12, for 12 years. We had a chokehold on him. We had satellite surveillance. We had uh, tightest economic sanctions where they couldn't get medicine for their dying babies and they weren't, wouldn't have died under because they had the normal ailments for children. They could not get, just check the World Health Organization on that factor. And we were bombing them every other night and in the, in the closest, closest time to the war, they were bombing every night, what they called the no-fly zone. But nobody was there to really find out if they were limited to the no-fly zone. Okay. And, and even if they were, this is, you know, this certainly would have given the Iraqi leadership hierarchy some warning that we had the capability. Why would they challenge the United States superpower, the only superpower in the world? And um, when you, uh, have you seen kind of a change in the, the, new, the, the speeding up of the news cycle and how that affects um, the news, how it's covered over, over the years with the cable and internet? Well, I think that the 24-hour cable, of course, it's good and it's bad. I mean, it's good. We're saturated and that's fine. Everybody knows what's going on, but there's no depth. Okay. And let's see. From your experience, is there a lot of times when senior administration officials are speaking off the record when they could in fact be speaking on of the Of course, record? all the time. <laughs> what are the... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead sir. Oh, there are times, of course, when, when they will put anything on it. We always challenge when they say on the background, we say, why? I mean, they want to tell you that, uh, what's the big secret about where Italy is? This is the kind of nonsense. But they get used if they don't want to be identified. But uh, a lot of times they do want to be identified, so. But I think we should always challenge the background meaning you cannot name them, you can attribute what they say or to a senior administration official. And I think that you don't fool world, world chancelleries as to who's speaking. And it, has it, to your knowledge, ever, if someone's speaking on background and it turns out what they were telling you was in fact wrong, do you feel that there's a, a, a breach of contract? What there? they tell you is so innocuous that, uh, I mean, you're not getting any big, big tops state secrets from them. What you're getting is their message so that the president can dominate the scene. If he's making a speech that day, then we'll have a backgrounder so that it doesn't interfere with the president's name. And can you talk to how the president can dominate the news cycle? Anytime the president opens his mouth, you think it's important. If you're a reporter, you certainly are going to record it for history and for whatever is happening. So it's important. Certainly they can dominate any, any kind of news cycle. And, but uh, uh, a lot of TV networks, I notice, don't carry it unless they think ahead of time that there will be news, which is ridiculous. No reporter for any print press would ever ask, are you going to make news? You go there and you listen and you decide. But TV people want to ensure so that you won't miss As the World Turns or Monday Night Football or whatever it is that distracts, uh, I mean, heavens. So when, you, when you see the difference, do you see a difference between the, the type of questionings or the, the approach that television reporters take versus print reporters? Television reporters take a lot longer to say the simplest things. I believe the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But they know the value of have holding the camera, and uh, a minute and a half is nirvana for them. We don't, I don't think print reporters think in those terms, but 
TV people do frame their questions in a different way, and I don't think they're as challenging. That doesn't go for Sam Donaldson, my favorite. I mean, he was pretty straight to the point, but others sort of soften the question. And not not all. Some are very tough. And do you see that um, a lot of the storylines that television reporters, are they constrained with their deadlines being earlier and having to already figure out what the story is? And Well, I think they certainly have to think in those terms. They also have to think of the picture. They, they are constantly, you know, it's not a story unless there's a photo to go with it or television, but and I'm exaggerating, but what I mean is it means a lot to have the visual for them, so they ha do have to plan ahead and think, think in those terms. Okay. And um, were you present at the, uh, the March 6th press conference uh, leading up to the, the war in Iraq? And yes, I, yes, I was. What do you remember from that? Um, Questions like, do you pray? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, just, uh, I'm not going to be asking, my, okay. my version, okay. so just to Well, I, well, I think that uh, the March 6th press conference was eerie in the sense that reporters knew this was the curtain raiser, and yet we didn't really ask. I, he didn't call on me. I had my hand up all the time, <laughs> annoying them. But uh, the president should have been asked a lot more many more questions that would, would have gone to the core of why do you want this war? Have you done, have you exhausted everything to avoid it and so forth? Where is the threat? And do you think that there was a fear in reporters from standing up and asking? Well, we knew the die was cast. I think that reporters had this sense of the inevitability and they were simply accepting what he said. And uh, he doesn't like to be interrupted, and he doesn't like follow-ups, so you don't, uh, I mean, he sort of cuts you off and embarrass. I'm, I'm not afraid of a president cutting me off. I'll just pursue the question, which is what you're supposed to do. Here, they are there to be accountable. We pay them. They are public servants, and that's my attitude, and we hope they'll do the right thing by their office. And you said before that a press secretary has to have a kind of a schizophrenic personality serving two masters. Can you speak about that? Well, I think good press secretaries not only are spokespersons for the president, the whole federal government, the whole United States, and the American people. And you can only do that with fear and trepidation. But the other responsibility, the other hat, of course, is to really be responsive to the people so that they will be informed. You cannot have a democracy without an informed people. And the more they know, the better off they are and better judgments they can have. And how do you kind of evaluate the communications policy and performance of this? Well, they all are in lockstep. They have one message. They stay on the same page no matter what. Their press secretaries are given very little ru running room and uh, so they're very predictable and no matter what you ask they give you the same answer and so do you it's very limiting what is, what is limiting? Go ahead. The, these spokesmen are very limited in what they can say it's very clear they were sent out with marching orders to just uh, stick to a set quote and you can see them reading you can see the press secretary reading along the sidelines where they finally had to scribble everything in. They're not given much, uh, you know. And um, talk about, the, is there always a press gaggle in the morning that's off the record and then there's... It's the, not off the record. So. The morning gaggle is not televised. It's on the record, but... Uh, um, I don't think it's filmed at all, but we certainly can use anything from it. It's very limited to around 15 minutes to lay out the President's day. And Do you see a difference between what kind of questions and what kind of interactions happen during the gaggle versus the regular press briefing? 
Not that much. There is a big difference. There is a difference in the sense that on the televised museum, you usually go into much more detail. But you know, the time is very limited for the so-called gaggle. But a lot of the, the televised news conference will be a repetition of what we had in the morning. Okay. And... Uh, what is your sense of uh, when, how public relations or different um, strategies of not answering questions, how, you know, th th there are a lot of journalists that are uh, aware of these uh, tactics that are being used if the questions, and how many times should you keep on asking the same question before you know you're not going to get an answer? I'd ask to infinity. Because when the question is legitimate, it should not be dropped. But of course, I mean, you have to move on, or the press secretary will just take some, someone else when they know you're pressing. And uh, I think it's very important to get the question on the record whether they answer it or not. And when you come in every day, do you have to read the New York Times, watch, go over, you know, what you do in the morning to kind of get prepared for? what questions you're going to be asking that day. I read many newspapers in the morning. If you don't know what's going on, and while we're sleeping, half the world is making trouble, according to a Secretary of State, which is really tells that you have to know what's happening. You cannot go to the White House and not be prepared for what the events are and what has been breaking through. But of course, you can't know everything, and. Uh, News is always breaking. As long as people are on this planet, there will be news. And uh, in your evaluation of the news coverage, do you, did you see that it was more event-based as opposed to issue-based, looking over long periods of time, more of like what's happening each day? Well, it's. I would say that it's issue-based at the White House when they're preparing for a new legislative session or something. But if something's happening, there's a real crisis, then it's events, so it's both. And when you, uh, let's see. Can you talk a little bit about uh, a pool spray and, you know, when, or the... Uh... Yes, when uh, a group of photographers and reporters designated, usually wire services, and then newspaper reporter and so forth, and the photographers go into the Oval Office after a, a meeting, the President's meeting with the head of state, he will answer a few questions. And uh, he'll only take one or so from a person. There's no follow-up. It's very uh, unsatisfactory, I think. But at the same time, it's, if that's all you can get, it's fine. Are you usually a part of that pool? Or? No, I'm not in the pool anymore. I was for years as a wire. I worked for UPI for 57 years, so I, I had a lot of pools, and I, I had a lot of opportunity to ask presidents questions. And uh, I must say, they took them. <laughs> and they, they took a deep breath first, though. <laughs> Can you talk a little I bit? think when you have one chance in the barrel, you should not let the president off the hook. I mean, you are representing the American people in the sense that that's your job. And can you talk about some of the differences that you see of uh, being a wire reporter versus now more editorial? Sure. The, when you're a wire service reporter, everything is a, a news story in the sense that you don't pass up anything, and you're heavily on the body watch. When the president goes anywhere, you go, and so forth. It's a little different. I'm more laid back now. I'm a columnist, and so I can. And you never put your opinion in your stories if you're with wire service. It's just the facts, ma'am. And uh, when I write a column now, I can express myself, my own feelings. And do you feel that uh, kind of the constraints of objectivity, of getting both sides on uh, an issue, when, especially when both sides agree, you know, how do you, you know, what is the standard? Can you talk a little oh, bit about Both sides that? don't usually agree, but I think uh, American people are much better served when they get a, an objective news story and not my opinion. It's not that important. 
No, I think that the straight facts and people can make up their own minds. That's best. And usually there are two sides. But what happens when there's more than two sides? Then you should try to get that too. I mean, to be fair and have a story that's really fair and balanced. Being fair is, is the, to me, that's the holy grail of journalism. And did you see a lot of skeptical viewpoints uh, in the press or in the press corps, you know, leading up to the war in Iran? Not enough. There should have been much more I'm questioning. Sorry. Yeah. Not enough uh, skepticism. We learned skepticism in a heavy, heavy way after Watergate, where for nine months we printed untruths because we were told from at the White House. We never should have fallen back into that. We should have asked many more questions. We're dealing with human beings and lives, and presidents have to be accountable for who they sent to war and why they have to explain the reasons for war and they have to be legitimate. And do you have a sense of, you know, does the government lie or, you know, can you speak to that? Or? Well, do they lie? They would not call it a lie, but a lot of times uh, the truth is just half-truth or distorted information and so forth for their own pur purpose. I mean, uh, it's very sad because I think it's so important that American people be well informed and truthfully informed. They're, they're the ones making the sacrifice, and you shouldn't have to sacrifice on, on falsehood. Okay, can you just, so I think I interrupted you. Just well, you should, we always hope that we'll be getting the straight goods from the government, and I think the American people deserve no less. Okay. And what is, do you see that this administration is living up to that, or do you feel that they're... Of course not. I think the reports uh, have come out lately on the reasons for the war and so forth. Every reason given has been just knocked down. I mean, there must be a, a lot of, there should be much more anguish in the country. Do you really go drop bombs on people? On, under falsehoods, and this is what the Senate Invest Intelligence Committee said, that they were falsehoods. And do you feel that it is the CIA's fault, or do you feel that this administration was, you know, determined to go to war regardless of what the intelligence was? I don't know, but I think that uh, the CIA knew what was expected of them. I think they very, very well knew that they had a president who who was quite determined, and so everybody's at fault in a sense. Okay. Um, let's see Oh, um, do you, looking at uh, inter issues of international law, can you kind of give a, a sense of the importance that, as journalists, but also this administration sees issues of international law? <laughs> I can see that this administration doesn't care about international law or any of the international agreements we've made since World War II. The, they arrived here and they started tearing up practically every treaty that's been made since World War II. Anti-ballistic missile treaty, the, uh, they have, certainly have not gone for any of the other. They've not worked very hard for one treaty that was the Chemical and Biological uh, Weapons Covenants. We were part of a 144 nations signed it many, many years ago. In the last seven or eight years before he, the president arrived, there was a committee that set up, uh, that worked on a provision to, for some enforcement of the Chemical and Biological Weapons Convention. And they, they had this protocol ready, which would allow some enforcement, not th thorough. 
we twice sabotaged it. Even though we were accusing Iraq of having these kind of weapons and would have, you know, enhanced our ability to go in and check because we didn't want any inspection of our laboratories, plants. Um, so, all the many, many treaties. They just ignored the UN, they scoffed at the UN and uh, international law. I mean, the, the biggest, of course, incredible fallacy is the the ignoring of the Geneva Conventions uh, at Al Gharib a prison in Baghdad the abuse we are stained for life with that historically with the treatment of those prisoners not charged not tried not convicted but held also in Guantanamo Can you, uh, when building up to the war in Iraq, there seemed to be the administration had a very disdainful view of the inspections, and they almost, you know, didn't want. Can you speak about that a little bit? Well, uh, they had already made up their minds, I think, to go to war, and uh, so anything they could do to repudiate what was going on and say that they were being, I, I'm, Saddam, you know, kept saying he didn't have them. I'm not saying he had told the truth. It was very deceptive himself. But that still didn't give them an excuse. It's, um, if you want to do something, you do it. You just, you can do it. Okay. I mean, he was an enemy enough. He had committed so many horrors that uh, nobody was about to defend Saddam Hussein. Right. And do you, uh, do you have a sense that or this regime change policy, you know, what is, do you have a sense of the, the legal, legality of, of within international law or within the Well, I think law? it was absolutely uh, illegal under the UN Charter. Under the UN Charter, and under self-defense, you go to own, your own defense when you're attacked or if you have a treaty with another country to go to their aid if they're attacked. Those are the only reasons. You do not. Preemptive, preventive war, the oxymoron, no. That's not uh, under under international law. That's not acceptable. If it was, everybody would have the right to go into any country that they decided, and that's wrong. It's wrong. No matter how bad their leader, unless they really violate, and unless the UN said we're going to war, we had no right to do it. Sure, they said there would be serious consequences in the last resolution, but did not sanction going to war. The United Nations never did against Iraq. Do you get, did you get a sense from your other, the other correspondents that they thought it would be legal, or that they weren't, they, they weren't seem to be challenging? I didn't, I didn't ask them. I don't know what they thought. All I know is that they should have asked more questions, and maybe they'll think the same thing of me. So uh, I don't know what they did. Uh, we, there's a lot of give and take, but there isn't that. Every reporter prides himself or herself on her own ability to think things through. And no, I think everybody pulled in their horns. In a crisis, you always do for your country. Now, you can't change that. But somewhere, there is truth. And. Um, I don't think there's any reporter who didn't know in the White House press room for the six months in the run-up that they definitely were headed. In, the administration was headed in the direction of a conflict. So, did you say that everyone in that six months knew that war was inevitable? Or? If they didn't, they had to be blind, deaf, and uh, I mean, I don't see how you can avoid it when every day, all of a sudden, they're bringing up Saddam Hussein. Every day it was fixed in our minds. It's just so. So, at what point do you think that you thought that, you know, you say when they first came into the office, but, you know, after Labor Day of 2002, they started to really. There was never any doubt in my mind they had an agenda to, to go to war. Everything they did pointed to that. I mean, you could hardly avoid the the factors, and you wondered why. Why did they need it? Why did they want it? 
And then when he kept saying, my daddy, uh, he tried to kill my daddy. And there was nothing that didn't make you feel you were on one course. So in, in your evaluation, why did we go to war? Why did the United States do this? I don't know. I, I don't know. I think oil had a big, was a big factor. The, the, you know, the, the whole fact that we are so dependent on foil, foreign oil. Iraq has the second largest reserves, and uh, I suppose there was genuine fear of that. And, and maybe they didn't realize what the cost of war was. None of them had been to war except for Colin Powell. Not that you have to go to war to know it's horror, but... And uh, from your senses, did, did Israel have anything to do, our policy towards Israel? Is there any, you know, to re-shift the balance? I honestly do not know. I mean, we were told, we were told that we were threatened, that there were weapons of mass destruction, and there were ties to the terrorists. Those are the three major reasons given for the war. And then after Anything else you can speculate on. There are a thousand reasons that you, you might, you could say that he had a personal vendetta or anything else. It's hard for me to believe that anybody would take us into war for that. I think the the main reason that they use now is a human rights justification that you know he had committed all these horrors. That's a fallback position. And you I'm could, sorry. What, what was that? Uh, the human rights aspect, of course, it was a fallback position. But you could go into many countries. If, I mean, go into Afghanistan, go into Pakistan, go into all of these places where you want human rights. Who knows? And. The, the administration did seem to have a very negative viewpoint for the United Nations, and then in January there was a shift. They were going to go after a second resolution. Can you can you talk about you know why do you see that you know there was a shift to, to try to get this uh, explicit authorization from the UN? Because they're out there alone. The U.S. wanted. I'm sorry. Good. The United States wanted an exit strategy. It's gotten deep into the quagmire. So it needed the UN backing, and the UN knew that had to come to the US aid. But uh, we crawled back. And do you, there was a lot of uh, attacking on isolating France as a, a, as a country, you know, individually. Can you speak to that? Like, you know, well, I think that was wrong, because I think Frank, France tried to warn us. France tried to warn us not to go into Vietnam after Dien Bien Phu, where she, it was solidly defeated in South Vietnam, and we went in anyway. It tried to warn us not to go into Iraq and so forth, but it wasn't just France, it was uh, many countries in Europe who really felt it was a folly. Hmm. So when you look back on this, this time period, what like really sticks out to you as you're Pardon? What, when you look back on, you know, from like August '02 up to the lead up to the war, what really sticks out, you know, when you think about this time period? What sticks out is if you want to go to war, if you want to give a war, you can give a war. But some days, people might not come, <laughs> unless you could justify it a little better. I shouldn't laugh, but isn't that the old saying? Someday they're going to give a war, and nobody's going to come. Okay. I'd like to see that day. <laughs> okay, and I think that's. Oh, you know, when you, since you've covered so many presidents, you know, how, how do you evaluate this this current, you know, president over all the other ones that you've covered? Not at the top of my list. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're good. This president not at the top of my list in term, the, pe the word peace doesn't cross his lips enough. And I think that uh, we should give peace a chance first and always the longest option. And do you have a vision for peace? You know, what does it, what was, what's it going to take 
for us to kind of achieve peace from this point of where we're at? What does the United States have to do in that role? Pull the troops out by January after the Iraqis have their election. They'll solve their problems. They got it. The Vietnam did, uh, and uh, we we've made friends with them. Obviously, we'll have good relations and so forth. But stop the killing. War is killing and being killed. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you.